I'm a critical care physician and an infectious disease physician uh, at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem in North Carolina in the United States. So uh, Dr. Algeth, these are my disclaimers. I have some uh, research support to my institutions and some advisory panel memberships. None of th this has anything to do with what we'll be talking about though. So the scope of the problem, and of course, uh, just to briefly summarize what uh, our colleagues have said earlier, is that we know in critically ill patients that delayed active therapy, meaning an antibiotic that treats the infection you actually have, increases mortality, at least in septic shock and to some extent in uh, hemodynamically stable sepsis as well. And we see this from the work of uh, Dr. Anand Kumar and uh, many other distinguished colleagues from CHEST in 2009, where delayed inappropriate or inappropriate empiric therapy Un, you know, uh, say vancomycin for gram-negative infection, those patients die more. We also see that increased antimicrobial use increases the risk of resistance. So for example, here, carbapenem exposure uh, is strongly correlated to the later development of carbapenem-resistant infections. We also know that we have difficulty distinguishing at the bedside at the time of presentation between bacterial, fungal, and viral causes of sepsis, or in fact, non-infectious causes of systemic inflammation that resemble sepsis. Uh, this is by Dr. Chappelle and Dr. Klompas and Ochoa and colleagues from Critical Care Medicine in 2021. 35% of patients with suspected bacterial sepsis who receive broad-spectrum antibiotics in emergency departments do not have bacterial infections. And then lastly, we have the challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, of delays intrinsic to culture-based assays. It takes 48 to 72 hours to get actionable results from culture-based assays on a good day. And the technology we use for cultures is fundamentally the same as that developed by Ms. Fani Hesse in 1881 using auger, essentially grinding up seaweed and growing bacteria on it. This is the gold standard on which we rely, but we, we are in a situation where we have to make decisions based on 72 hours in the future. So what can we do about this? So how can we make decisions faster and better? Um, these technologies are in rapid development, but the optimal solution we're looking for is something that is rapid, that is actionable, meaning it gives us data that affects clinical decisions, that is both sensitive and specific. On some level, it needs to be capable of detecting antimicrobial resistance. Um, if that weren't an issue, we could just put everyone on Vank and Miro and let her rip, right? And then lastly, there are pros and cons to different types of assays, PCR-based assays versus antigens-based assays versus various biomarkers. I'm not going to get into procalcitonin and related ones. Uh, Dr. Algathami uh, discussed that very, very clearly just a moment ago. There are a number of commercial assays and investigational assays right now. Now, the ones I've highlighted here, upper and lower respiratory tract infections, bloodstream and then rapid detection of resistant genes. Those are the ones we're going to focus on, but it's useful for folks to know that there are um, reasonably effective, for example, GI panels now that can rapidly identify, say, Campylobacter uh, uh, from a diarrhea specimen or neurologic specimens. We've actually started using a very helpful bone and joint panel here on our infectious disease consult service at Wake. So we'll start by looking at respiratory infections. So there are multiple commercial assays that are currently available. Film array is a common one. Uh, Univero is another one that uh, is relatively widely used depending on where you work. Um, so these provide semi-quantitative detection of multiple pathogens, as well as common determinants of beta-lactam resistance. And I have to underline that it's beta-lactam resistance. So far, we don't have many assays that reliably detect, rapidly detect non-beta-lactam resistance. And this is for a number of reasons, one of which is that the, the, uh, the, the genetics of, say, quinolone resistance are much more complicated than, say, methicillin resistance and Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, there are a number of these assays that detect um, uh, viruses as well. Uh, older LRTI panels or older lower respiratory tract infection panels may not detect SARS-CoV-2. That has started to change in the last few months. But a lot of these panels, when they say coronavirus, they're, ref they're referring to the previously endemic coronaviruses that were commonly associated with upper respiratory tract infections. But most of these assays, and here on the right, this is uh, an example, just as an example from the BioFire pneumonia panel. Um, They'll detect MEC-A and MEC-C, which are the most common determinants of methicillin resistance in Staph aureus. They'll detect usually CT, excuse me, CTXM, which is the most common ESBL in North America. Obviously, your geography is going to play a big role here in which is most useful. And then carbapenemases, uh, OXA, NDM, VIM, KPC, and IMP. So what is the impact of this on you? So this was the inhaled WP1 study. This is a multi-center um, multi study 
uh, that looked at 625 specimens from patients with suspected hospital-acquired or ventilator-associated pneumonia done in the United Kingdom. And what they found is by routine microbiology, they detected a pathogen 44.2% of the time. But with these two different commercial assays, the numbers were much better. Now, uh, film array did a little bit better in this assay, but nonetheless, they were both solid improvements in being able to identify a pathogen and hopefully adjust and improve therapy more quickly. Um, if you look harder at what were the culture negative detections, you know, 73 culture negative detections where the PCR assay identified a pathogen, what, but culture did not, um, about 8.2% depending on the depending on the uh, uh, on the patient studied, it, it just for whatever reason, culture failed. However, a large number of them were either reported out as quote, normal oral flora. And there is some discussion about whether some of these oral streptococci play more of a role in uh, pneumonia than we appreciate. And then the another half of them were largely the result of, empiric antibiotic use before the assay was obtained, before cultures were obtained. This is a very difficult to prevent problem. And these PCR assays may help us get around that. Now, if you look and see what do clinicians actually do with the results, again, uh, this was a separate study, but looked at whether or not patients had appropriate de-escalation or discontinuation of antibiotics in the study. And about half of them did. Uh, however, unfortunately, about a sixth of them continued on unnecessary broad spectrum therapy. And this is going to be just like my, uh, especially like Dr. Agathami mentioned earlier, this is where the integration of stewardship becomes important. We need to have not just better tests, but better mechanisms to get us, to get clinicians at the bedside to modify our prescribing practices in response to good, good test results. Okay, let's take a look at bloodstream infections. So bloodstream infections with, con with conventional automated blood culture systems, they are continuously monitored, but they're fundamentally binary. A blood culture is positive or negative. Um, <clears throat> it is difficult to get, say, semi-quantitative results. There are techniques you can use for that, but they are less useful. There is a strong impact of prior antimicrobial use, unfortunately. And as I mentioned earlier, you are at best going to be waiting 48, and generally up to 72 hours before you have identification of a pathogen and susceptibility results available to help you modify your treatments. So when we look at rapid diagnostic assays for bloodstream, for bloodstream infections, there are methods that use rapid gene detection for positive blood cultures. There are rapid species identification with MALDI-TOF. Uh, there are now emerging assays that use whole blood multiplex PCR off of a whole blood specimen obtained at the time of patient presentation. Really, and then the future, next generation sequencing based on cell-free DNA, 16S ribosomal RNA, and related assays. So looking just at a couple of some of these rapid tests, um, there are a number of assays out there. These are these rapid tests require you to have a blood culture bottle basically pop positive. And the reason is that they lack an amplification step. So you need a certain threshold amount of bacteria in the specimen to be able to run the test. Uh, and generally what this is, is a positive blood culture with a positive gram stain. If you have that, it is probably enough genetic material. They do detect common beta-lactam resistance markers. With staphylococci, this is very good. If you don't have me if you have staph aureus and you don't detect MEK-A off that assay, it's not MRSA. Uh, the positive predictive value for things like ESBLs and, C and carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae is very high, but the negative predictive value is more limited. There are ESBLs and carbapenemases that slip through detection. Um, and this is, again, because gram-negative resistance is very genetically complex. Most of these assays, the only ESBL gene they detect is CTXM. There are others. And again, where you practice in the world plays a big role. And with pseudomonas, there's a lot of non-enzymatic resistance that will not be detected on these assays. Now, this is Malditoff, and I include this picture because it amuses me, but this was the day my old hospital got our Malditoff machine, and this was me uh, getting to know it on its first day. So this is matrix-assisted matrix laser desorption ionization time of flight. This is basically mass spectrometry performed on a positive culture. Now, you have to have a culture growing on a plate, but it does save you a day because it gives you identification of species at least within an hour. It is interesting that there are some species that we can't differentiate by Malditoff. E. coli and Shigella are the same species species, essentially, for example, the differences between them are relatively minor. Malditoff can't tell them apart. Um, this is an interesting concept that we can't use Maldi to detect drug resistance yet. But there are studies that look at, for example, putting beta-lactam antibiotics, incubating them relatively briefly 
within um, culture specimens, centrifuging them down, and then looking to see if you can detect beta-lactamases by detecting hydrolysis product of beta-lactams in the maldi -toff. This is just investigational, but it does show that there may be a path forward for using MALDI to identify drug resistance. Now, the holy grail, if you will, is potentially whole blood PCR, where you take a blood specimen and then you just do a multiplex PCR for the most common pathogens, generally looking about 90 distinct pathogens. Of course, you're not going to detect stuff that isn't on the panel, a chromobacter, for example, but um, but it is fast. It is less sensitive, about 29% sensitive compared to a blood culture standard. But if someone has received antibiotics, it is more likely to be positive in that setting. This may be something that will improve with time, but I propose that probably the actual holy grail, if you will, is going to be next generation sequencing. And this is a measurement of circulating non-human cell-free DNA from patient plasma. This is potentially very rapid. It is not pathogen specific. You don't need to have the organism in the panel. What you do need is a bunch of reference and control specimens from healthy adults adults to account for the microbial DNA that you normally find in human plasma, like a, a cootie bacterium or staph epidermidis, be able to screen out the background non-human DNA noise to identify things. And this graph here just shows an example of a patient with Enterobacter cloacae bacteremia, who is compared against background samples with patients with Propionobacterium and the like. Um, there is some observational data backing up this study. This was a study done in Germany, 15 patients with septic shock, mainly of abdominal stores. They are compared to 20 control patients who underwent elective surgery. 33% blood culture positivity baseline uh, in septic patients, 72% of patients, excuse me, compared with a 72% detection rate for next generation sequencing, much more rapidly than cultures came back. And 53% of these findings would have led to changes in therapy. There is going to be a forthcoming prospective multicenter study called Next Genesis that will start to validate this approach more formally. So where does this leave us? Culture is not dead yet. It still remains our gold standard, but we are need to have a way to be able to identify patients both with the actual pathogens affecting them so that we can target our therapy and to find some way to at least identify the great majority of antibiotic resistance, or at least beta-lactam resistance quickly. We still need phenotypic testing in culture plates. Uh, we still need culture to identify novel mechanisms of resistance. There is still some difficulty distinguishing between important pathogens like E. coli and Shigella. All of this, to, in order to work, needs close coordination with your stewardship programs. Um, but if we make this work, rapid identification of pathogens can improve antimicrobial selection up front, hopefully reduce toxicity, and all of this together has a goal of improving patient outcomes. This is me. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today. I really uh, am most grateful for the opportunity.